Good morning or perhaps good evening, depending on where you're joining us from today. My name is Coral Owen. I'm the Professional Development Coordinator for the Military Families Learning Network, and it's my absolute pleasure to welcome you to the third and final session of our inaugural Military Family Readiness Academy. The Academy is host to an annual programming series designed for military family service providers working in any field. Each series will feature multiple sessions as well as unique engagement opportunities such as this year's Outpost and Outpost Online. Today's session, Planning for the Worst, Hoping for the Best, is the final installment of our three-part series for this fall, Disaster and Hazard Readiness Foundations. The spring in 2021, we'll continue this conversation by delving into disaster and hazard readiness in action with part two of the MFRA. To review our conversations from this fall for sessions one and two, you can visit the MFRA MFRA uh, 2020 homepage to find those respective recordings. Registration for the spring series is also available at this time, so we do hope to see you in the spring as well. In case you're joining us for the first time, I'd like to give you a brief tour of our webinar platform so you can find your way around. Hopefully you're currently able to view the slides we're sharing. If you can't see them or having any other technical difficulties throughout today's session, please just send us a tech support request via email to milfamln at gmail.com. You can download the slides and resources on our session page today. We'll place that link in the chat pod here in just one moment. As many of you have already done, we do look forward to having you join us in the chat pod today for conversation and for questions. To embed the chat so you don't miss any links or conversations, simply place your cursor over the shared slides. You should then see a toolbar pop up across the bottom of your screen, and then from there, simply select that chat bubble icon. When typing your comments and questions, please do be sure to select the all panelists and attendees response option. You can find that in the drop down menu right above where it says type message here. We invite you to do this just so everyone who is on today's session can view those uh, conversation pieces in the chat pod. We'll also be covering evaluation and continuing education information at the end of today's session. The Military Families Learning Network is part of a DOD USDA partnership for military families and our passion is to connect military family service providers and cooperative extension professionals to research and to each other through innovative online programming. It is now my pleasure to introduce our moderator for today, Dr. Keith Tidball. Dr. Tidball is the PI for MFLN's Community Capacity Building Concentration Area. He's also the Associate Director for Environment and Natural Resources with Cornell Cooperative Extension and holds an appointment as Senior Extension Associate in the Department of Natural Resources. In addition to his extension roles, Dr. Tidball also currently serves as Commander with the 2nd Detachment of the 10th Area Command for the New York Guard. I'll now turn things over to Dr. Tidball to introduce our speaker and facilitator for today. Thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I appreciate that introduction, Coral, but it is my pleasure to introduce our facilitator for our third and final uh, section of the Military Family Readiness Academy, Dr. Angie Lindsay. Uh, Dr. Lindsay is an assistant professor at the University of Florida in the Department of Family, Youth, and Community Sciences and her research focuses on disaster preparedness and recovery within uh, rural communities. And she looks at crisis communications efforts before, during, and after disasters. So Angie, uh, it's a pleasure to be with you again for this, this third uh, session, and I look forward to what you have to say to us today. Great, thank you, Keith. Well, hello, everyone. It's on an honor to be back with y'all here again today, and I do want to thank Keith and the entire Military Family Learning Network team for having me for this series. It's been an honor and I've enjoyed it. I've learned so much from, from everyone and, and just thank uh, the team for, for having me, but also thank all the participants for their engagement and for asking questions, some great questions and some great conversations. So I'm very excited to be uh, presenting the final session, the session three here, but I'm a little sad too. So I'm hoping that uh, we can continue some of the great conversations that we've had these past two sessions and today as well. So today is kind of a culmination, a little bit of everything from session one and session two, a little bit of application, if you will, of, you know, looking at the different levels of emergency uh, management and disaster preparedness uh, and looking at some of the impacts and then overall of how do you plan for these types of hazards and disasters. So our objectives today are to understand the importance of planning for hazards and disasters at different levels and discuss four different ways in which to prepare 
Um, hopefully we'll talk about a few others, but at least four. Uh, identify some federal, state, and local resources to assist with some preparation. We have some great resources available. Uh, and there's a lot of great resources out there and many that um, I'm sure y'all know about as well. And then also practice preparing a hazard and disaster plan document. At least look at some of the critical pieces of this document. And it, some of these are very individualized, but at least there's some core components of these. So we'll talk about that as well. So, and have we how we have started with other uh, sessions, I definitely wanted to start with this as well and looking at the unique challenges that military families have. And, and as we know, disaster preparedness is crucial in any community and with any family. But for military families, uh, this is preparation for a disaster can look differently compared to the civilian population. In addition, military families have do documents to keep track of, family members with special needs, or even separated family. Uh, additionally, some National Guard folks may be deployed or state, of active state active duty when disasters do hit. So therefore they're not able to be home with their families when that recovery is happening. So some very unique challenges that military families have in looking at preparation for hazards and disasters. So definitely wanna keep this in mind as we go through today's presentation. We wanna hear from y'all as well about some of those unique challenges and some ways that uh, potentially when you are preparing, how do you address some of those unique challenges as well. So if you weren't able to join us uh, for session two, which was last month, we talked a lot about the impacts and responses and disaster and uh, hazard readiness as well. Um, and some of those overall impacts included individual and family impacts, as well as looking at community impacts and whole community and building capacity um, to somehow, uh, to, to sometimes lessen some of those impacts as well. And then we also talked about some of the factors that impacted community response and recovery overall. And then lastly, we identified some tools and tactics to assist in that response and recovery. And you can see here the recording is available as well as the continue education at the links there as well if you're interested in checking out that session. Some great conversations uh, we had at the end of that session also. So I'm going to go a little bit back to the first session here. This is a slide from actually my first session when we talked about the four state four phases of hazards. And so we talked about the mitigation, preparedness, response, and recovery. And hazards are those actual disturbances, events, or phenomena. And these can be threats to humans and what they value. And they have the potential for damage and widespread impact. So each one of these. And looking at these and thinking about our session today, one of the things that I think about is how do we prepare for each of these phases? How do you prepare for mitigation? How do you make sure that you're prepared for uh, preparing for a potential disaster? How do you prepare for response and how do you prepare for recovery? So I'm gonna put a question out to y'all to begin with and in thinking about these four phases and preparing for these different phases, which phase do you think would be the hardest to plan for? And you can use the chat box, I'm sorry. Just ch chat box, just a quick, one one word response which phase do you think would be the hardest to prepare for and looking at the four phases mitigation recovery response yep recovery response preparedness yep this is great absolutely so i see a lot of recoveries and and you're absolutely right a lot of times we don't know what those impacts are going to be i mean we try to prepare and be as proactive as possible for disasters but by the very nature of hazards and disasters uh they are um sometimes very unpredictable uh, if any of y'all were watching the storm that uh hit florida last week last week we <laughs> didn't know up until probably the day before where it was actually going to come in at so they can be very unpredictable and so therefore not knowing um the unpredicted unpredictability of these hazards and these disasters makes it hard to plan for all the different phases i think so i think all of these are right these preparedness and mitigation response and particularly recovery because you don't know the impacts can be very difficult to plan for because of the uniqueness of hazards and uniqueness of disasters and the unpredictability of them as well so i'm going to introduce you and i know for those Trivial Pursuit fans out in the audience, like every time I look at this, I think of those little Trivial Pursuit pieces, you know, where you put the little pieces of the pie in when you get that, that particular color right. Um, this completely, I call it the Trivial Pursuit model, but I'm, 
I'm a very big fan of this model. I like this model a lot, and I use this model a great deal in some of my work and some of my research as, as well. Um, and this is a model out of uh, Australia by a gentleman by the name of Jackson. Basically, what he has done is he's taken issue and crisis management and kind of put them together. Uh, and the reason that, that he did that, and if you'll see, there's no arrows other than right there on the very top uh, showing that there's no linear pattern. Uh, so this is a non-linear model. And that's one of the reasons that I really, really like it because as we know, many of us has been through uh, crisis situations and disasters where things don't always happen in a nice and easy line like they're supposed to. Uh, so I like the ability to look at you know, early warning and scanning, and then all of a sudden you're in crisis management. So you don't have to go in a linear pattern. And I like uh, this model for that particular reason. And the right side of the model, really, you can see is more that pre-crisis management. And you have in there some of the systems manual, some of the training and preparation. But then in that bottom right-hand quadrant, you also have some of the early warning scanning and also the risk management also. But then going into that emergency response as well. So you've got the mitigation and the preparation, but also getting a little bit into the response in that lower right-hand quadrant as well. Um, but I, I like this model because it gives us the ability to move to different levels uh, in not a linear fashion, a nonlinear fashion. And thinking about this model, I think about the, the crisis that we're in right now with the global pandemic. Think of our current situation in COVID. In a lot of places, we're still in that crisis management in that lower left-hand quadrant, crisis, trying to manage this crisis as well as we can but we're also in the response and that emergency response area and different parts of the country are in different uh, levels of it. And so many of us are in many different levels of this crisis right now within this model right now. So I think that really shows the beauty of the nonlinearity of this particular model, looking at the global pandemic that we're already in and that many of us are on several different levels of this model, uh, looking at the particular crisis that we're in right now. So I'll hey, talk Angie, a little, uh, yes. I question is coming. Uh, there's been a number of people who have, uh, I think, interestingly, put uh, preparedness down uh, in terms of what they see as, you know, one of the main challenges in, in terms of thinking through how this operates for military families. What is, what is your thought on that in terms of preparedness and the challenge that it, that it, that it uh, presents? You know, it seems to me that it's mostly about resources, right? It's about having the information and knowing what to do with it ahead of time. What, what is your thoughts about uh, those that are th th that being listed as as a primary challenge. I, I think I think you're absolutely right. And I think I think resources and, and understanding what resources you may need to address the impacts um, that you may or may not have from these particular uh, disasters and hazards. And I think with military families, it's even more important because of those unique challenges that we talked about a few minutes ago to look at those unique challenges um, while you're preparing. But again, it can be difficult to understand um, how those unique challenges are going to um, impact impact the response and recovery. So therefore planning can be very difficult, but trying to get those resources that you think that you will need when you're, when you're thinking about unique challenges and thinking about the impacts that could happen because of those unique challenges, uh, trying to get those resources ahead of times, I think would be very helpful. But we all know that sometimes that's not as easy as, as we would like for it to be sometimes when it comes to information or supplies. I mean, we definitely saw it with COVID at the beginning of this crisis. Trying to get the supplies we need was very difficult. So I, I think you're right. I think those resources, and that can include whether it be information, whether that can be supplies, whether it can be financial, economic. I think trying to get those resources to address some of the unique challenges from hazards and um, hazards and disasters is, is a very is a very difficult uh, thing to think about when you're talking about how do I prepare for what I'm not real sure is going to happen, basically. Interesting, thank you. Sure, thanks, that's a great question. Okay, so let's kind of dive into the each one of these particular uh, four phases and talking about how you prepare for this. So um, we talked about in the first session that mitigation is taking actions to prevent or reduce cause impact and consequences. And this kind of tends to be a little more of a formal level. Um, and some of the examples, I mean, many of you I'm sure are very, very familiar with this. The examples can include zoning practices, 
floodplain mapping, insurance programs, building codes, planning and regulation. Uh, and when I think about mitigation, I think about that kind of the upper right-hand quadrant of the trivial pursuit model, as I like to call it, um, and thinking about that risk mitigation or crisis prevention. Um, how best do we mitigate uh, that mitigate impacts um, from disasters. And again, a lot of uh, your counties will do uh, different types of zoning, flood map, floodplain mapping, insurance programs to try to mitigate some of those impacts as well. And so moving through the little, um, our model here, so looking at preparedness, and we talked a little bit about preparedness already, but, tr but preparedness is training in those educational activities what can we do now to try to prepare for those impacts? And just like Keith brought up, sometimes not, not really knowing what we can do now or not having the resources to um, resources right now in order to prepare can be very frustrating. It can be very difficult as well, especially if some of those resources are, um, are scarce and they're hard to get up, hard to get a part handle on. So again, this preparedness can be formal, it can be informal as well, things that we do in, independently, uh, things we do within our family, or it can also be with something that we do within our community, within our organization as well. Uh, these can be planning processes, systems, training, and that education that we talked about earlier. And you're looking to recovery and the impact to determine what systems, what resources may need to be in place. And this can be difficult because we're not sure what the impacts are going to be, where sometimes we're simply guessing at what some of those can be. Um, and in thinking about, you know, reaching out to other organizations that can help. These can be community and military organizations, as well as the COABs, which are communities, community organizations active in disasters, as well as volunteer organizations and BOADs or volunteer organizations active in disasters, which we've talked about in session one and session two. So there's organizations out there that can assist with um, these preparedness and try to help folks to be prepared for some of these unknown impacts and especially unique challenges by military families as well. And looking at response, and there's several folks actually said that, you know, response would be very hard to, to plan for. And absolutely, I agree. So this can be a response from an individual and family, family perspective. Uh, a lot of times we say try to listen to government officials, especially if you're dealing with evacuation and your personal and your family safety as well. You want to make sure that you try to stay up to date as inform on information as much as possible. I know um, for my particular county, we have an app on our phone that we can download that is providing us up to date information at all times. Uh, so making sure that you have those things already downloaded, making sure you have that information in place so that you can continuously get up to date information on what's going on and any any recommendations or guidelines from government, government officials that you need to know in pre pre preparation for the, for the hazard as well. Um, also be sure to download, I mentioned that already, download any apps that will provide information as well and be active in gathering this information uh, and know how best you like to receive information. If you maybe an app's not for you, maybe you prefer a radio station um, or a TV, local TV station. A lot of folks like the local TV stations as well. Just know how best you like to receive information and make sure that uh, you are keyed in and to, to receive information regarding that. Um, response we know happens immediately after, um, and it's implementing a lot of response plans, and also this is where the search and rescue missions come in as well. And then recovery, uh, which is a big one. Big recovery is a very big one. And this is taking actions to prevent or reduce cause, impact, and consequences. So again, trying to recover from those impacts, but also trying to lessen uh, the impacts as much as we can after a disaster as well. And then thinking about this, of course, this can be personally or family impacted. Do you have a plan to help others? Do you need to reach out to organizations that can help or preparing for impacts and potential consequences in addition? So some of this can be physically. Uh, are you Preparing yourself for recovery physically as well as mentally are those things that you can do, those mental health breaks that you're going to maybe need to take after um, a disaster uh, hits or the things you need to be doing economically. We all know, I mean, we've all heard, make sure you have um, 
you know, a rainy day fund, but that's always, that's not always feasible for everyone. So uh, just thinking through maybe some of the impacts, have you, have you looked in your insurance policies lately? Do you, do you have enough insurance if you were to have a flood or what the, the hazard may be, just making sure that you think through some of the physical, the mental, as well as the financial impacts that may happen and how can you possibly uh, plan for a better recovery and looking at those as well. And I also put plan to help others as well. And this includes your own family members, especially uh, with those with unique challenges or special circumstances. How can you help those family members that may need an extra, some extra help and help them recover as well? Neighbors, I mean, that's one of the things, especially here in Florida, after a storm, the first thing you see is everyone is getting out and trying to help each other. So uh, how can you help others if that's something that's important to you? And then lastly, volunteering. Uh, and again, there's organizations that can that you can join to help others uh, to help recover after disasters as well. And this includes CERT, which is with FEMA, which is Community Emergency Response Training. So there's some programs out there that allow you to uh, be involved with recovery programs and help other people as well. Angie, what's your experience with some of those um, programs as they relate to military families? Have you seen have you seen uh, involvement in CERT or other sorts of programs in the recovery phase or the recovery section of the Trivial Pursuit diagram that um, you, you could share with us? I, I, absolutely. So um, I'm speaking from Hurricane Michael that happened uh, in 2018 over in the Panhandle. Uh, we did see some uh, military folks that, I mean, we had Team Rubicon, Rubicon obviously, that helped in uh, recovery as well. But we also had a lot of CERT volunteers that were helping us that were from the Air Force Base over in Pensacola that came over. And it was just really helpful to be working with those folks. And they came over. I mean, Pensacola wasn't was an impacted uh, terribly by Hurricane Michael, but they drove, you know, an hour and a half, two hours to Panama City to come over and help. And so it was really helpful to meet those folks and, and be working with them as well. And they were all CERT trained. Great I'm going to put up a, a link to Team Rubicon. That's interesting. Thanks, Angie. Yes, no, two from Team Rubicon. Um, we have, we, there were some great guys. We <laughs> uh, we were working really closely with some of those at the, the incident command post. And so there was some some great folks. Okay, so I'm going to go uh, talk a little bit about impact. So this is obviously from our second session as well. And I, for many of y'all that were on that session, I'm a big fan of uh, this NOAA uh, particular infographic. I think it's just fascinating. And these are only the weather and climate disasters that we have already experienced in 2020. And I do believe it was updated in September. So it doesn't include um, IOTA or um, Eta or all the other uh, Greek alphabet names that we are into right now, as well as far as storms go. But it doesn't include COVID either. There's, I mean, I feel like there should be a dark cloud over this map that just has COVID on it. So, uh, but I just find this fascinating and looking at some of these billion dollar weather and climate disasters. And then to the right, so just talking about some of the impacts that are from these types of disasters. And a lot of these are multifaceted and multi-leveled. And again, you can have all of these at one time. So these impacts can be detrimental, and especially when they're combined with other impacts as well. Okay. Okay, so how do we prepare to lessen all impacts? And I mean, wouldn't it be nice if we could lessen all those impacts? And of course, that we, we can definitely try to. And so how do we prepare to do this? And it's important to think of each of these impacts when developing a plan. And as we showed in the last slide, there's a lot of impacts and there's some on, that are not listed on there even, uh, but it's important to try to think through each one of these as you're putting together a plan and brainstorm possible impacts and your response. And especially for military families and these unique challenges, you know, what, do, what are some of those impacts that maybe other folks may not have because of the special circumstances with military families? So think about some of those particular impacts that you may have as a military family that others may not have. So when you're looking at templates or plan templates that it may not be addressing that, but you may need to address that because of the unique challenges within a military family. And again, these are individualized and some of these impacts will look different for each person and each family as well. And it's important to remember that. 
And so many things are individual and personal. And we've talked a little bit about physical, and that can include your insurance, your home, your apartment, the mental planning for mental health breaks. Uh, you know, if you're going to evacuate, we suggest to people take a deck of cards. If you do knitting, coloring, doing things that you can, um, <clears throat> excuse me, that can help you take those mental health breaks as well. And then economics, uh, putting funds aside for a rainy day is not always feasible. Uh, is they're looking at possible insurance plans or things that possibly you can look at that may help uh, ease some of the financial impacts after disasters as well. So we always like to say that planning starts at home. I mean, all disasters are local. We've talked about that in session one and session two, but planning starts at home. And it's definitely something within our organization here at the University of Florida. One of the first things that we talk about with our extension faculty and family is number one, make sure that your family and yourself and your family are, are, are ready, that you have a plan, is everyone prepared and then reach out to the community and trying to work with them as well. So planning starts at home and it starts individually as well. We wanna to try to create a culture of planning for disasters. It's definitely something that we've tried to do here of making sure that uh, we try to give our folks the tools that they need to plan for to plan for their own family and their own individual first before going out into community as well. Lead by example, coming up with the, with a plan for your own personal, personal and family as well. Important to encourage individual and family planning. Organizational planning, make sure that your organization has a plan as well. And then moving to the higher level and the bigger picture community planning. And this includes networks, best management practices and sharing net resources as well. And a lot of these can be done and we'll talk about, talk about this a little bit more in a few minutes, but utilizing those bonds and those bridges that we talked about in session two, looking at those folks that are within our community that are within our network, but also looking at those outside of our network or outside of our county or outside of our area that can help with resources, but also may have some best management practices or folks that we can share uh, resources with or practices with in order to help the community respond and recover the best way possible. So I am going to throw another question out to y'all. And this is not, you know, there's no finger pointing, there's no judging here, but I'm just curious how many people have a disaster plan for their home and family. So I, as speaking as a former South Carolinian and now Floridian, I was definitely one of those folks for a long time of, ah, we know what to do with the hurricane, been through them before. Um, had I had anything written down? No, I had not. So I think a lot of Floridians think, oh, I've got one in my head. Uh, but it wasn't until a couple years ago that I sat my family down and actually came up with one. So I, I'm, I'm telling a little on myself, but uh, I'm just curious how many folks actually have one. Partial plans, always have a bag ready, awesome. I need to start one, yes. Add to it each year, oh, this is great. Living on the Gulf Coast is a must. Yes, Karen, absolutely. A fire plan, oh, these are great. This is wonderful. We have an earthquake kit ready, wonderful. Total plan in place, cert trained, aha, and a cert instructor, great, Michael. Food resources ready, vague plan for winter storms, bag, blanket. Ah, uh, yes, uh, that's a good point, Becky. You need to discard old meds and restock. Absolutely. I just bought, <laughs> funny you said that. I just bought some new Benadryl the other day for that very reason. I said, I think the Benadryl in our uh, disaster kit is actually old. So I went and bought some new. So it's funny you said that. Where we had fires, to woo, to fires, tornadoes, hurricanes, and blizzards. Even my pets know where to go when the tornado sirens go off. <laughs> that's great. Wonderful. Andrew, this is really interesting to see some of the comments coming through here. And I just want to point out that uh, ready.gov uh, has recently put up a military family preparedness page to include some step-by-step -step instructions for making a plan. Um, so I'm going to include that link in the chat uh, along with some of this other interesting um, telling on ourselves here over here. <laughs> That's great, Keith. Yes, I've seen some of their stuff for military families. It's fantastic. I think I have it on my last slide here today, too, as well. But yeah, these are great. Thanks, y'all, for sharing. This is great. Thank y'all. Okay, so thinking about keeping families safe, uh, we want to make sure that we encourage and communicate and educate about individual and planning, family planning as well. Try to provide those resources. There's planning templates. Keith just mentioned ready.gov. They have some great templates. There's also other places that have great templates as well. 
You want to make sure that you collaborate, connect with other organizations that can assist, especially organizations that uh, may have similar missions or may uh, you may work together already, or maybe organizations that you're like, hey, we should probably work together and trying to help. Uh, we have a similar target audience of there. Is there something that we can collaborate with together uh, to try to best meet the needs or the gaps in disaster preparedness with this particular tar target audience as well. And then make planning a part of regular communication efforts, including social media. I like to tell people that, you know, even for an organization, make sure that you are looking at, you know, twice a year or maybe two or three times a year where you are actually picking up that uh, plan and you're looking at it and making sure that it's up to date information, that the contact information is the same. And if you need to make any changes based upon uh, changes within your organization as well. So again, it kind of goes back to lead by example within your own organization to encourage families to do the same also. And continuing on with this, strategize how different parts of your target audiences may have different needs and gaps. And it's like we talked about, military families have some really unique challenges with that as well. And as you look at your different target audiences and some of the unique challenges they have, try to strategize, well, what will they need in, in, in preparing to to in preparing for disasters or hazards with some of these unique challenges. And some of this and some of the work that I've done for of trying to help extension folks help their communities best prepare, we have some areas uh, within Florida that are obviously very urban areas, but we have rural pockets in urban areas. And what I mean by that, so farm worker communities in South Florida that maybe have language barriers as well as technology barriers. Some of the information that we have out there regarding planning for disasters and planning for hurricane may not reach them. So how best do we reach that target audience to make sure they have the information that they need in order to prepare effectively and efficiently for these types of disasters as well? And again, the access to connectivity, not everyone is technologically uh, savvy. I'm not saying I am at all, but not everyone is, is comfortable with technology. So uh, making sure that you have maybe plan B or plan C for folks that are maybe not going to receive a text message or they're not going to receive an email. Is there other ways that you can reach out to them as well? So just some things to think about when you're thinking about your different target audiences and especially the unique challenges that military families may have as well. What would, what would they need in order, to, in order to address those unique challenges and looking at mitigation response and recovery and planning for those. And then preparing for your organization. We've talked a little about this as well. Preparing number one for your most valuable asset, your people. Uh, and again, this is something I think I've shared with y'all in session one or two after Hurricane Irma in 2017 here in Florida. Uh, the state hadn't been hit by a major hurricane since about 2004 and 2005. And uh, one of the things that we learned as an organization is um, after Hurricane Irma had gone through and we were talking with the leadership team on the phone and our 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 extension dean, Dr. Nick Place, first thing he said is, is everybody okay? Does everybody know if everybody is okay? And several of our folks were like, well, I haven't heard from so-and-so. I haven't heard from so-and-so. I don't know. And uh, Dr. Place said, that's unacceptable. These our people are our most important asset. So one of the first things that we did as an organization is we developed, you know, your basic phone tree. Your, so each extension office has a phone tree that has the cell phone number of each employee as well as an alternate uh, number also. But then we have a we've asked them to put in like their close of kin. So if we can't get a hold of them, is there somebody else within their family that we can call to make sure they're okay? Um, and that was one of the things that we did after Hurricane Irma, just our, our extension dean said, we have to protect our most valuable asset and it's our people. And making sure that your staff is an individual family plan too. So that's something that's been important um, within my organization also. Looking ahead, work together as an organization to develop a plan. And I would uh, definitely, Definitely highlight the importance of looking that internal, including the people and the infrastructure, and then an external as well, how best to meet the needs of your target audiences and the best and, and the best way to meet the needs and the gaps of your audiences, whether it be before disaster strikes and after a disaster strikes as well. So looking at that plan, both internally, making sure that your people and your infrastructure and your uh, resources are protected, but also externally and how best we help external uh, audiences, our different target audiences as well. Preparing internally, personally first to help others. It goes back to put your mask on first before helping others. So making sure that you are prepared first before you start to go out and help others as well. 
So uh, one of the th one of the things that I'm a big proponent of, and I know it probably sounds a little you know doom and gloom, but we used to uh, when I worked at the Jacksonville Zoo many years ago, we used to have uh, twice a year we used to have a meeting called the doom and gloom meeting. And as you can imagine, working at a zoo, we had all kinds of worst case scenarios that could possibly come up. Uh, but it was a doom and gloom meeting, and it was just that: what are some things that could go wrong? Which there were a lot at the Jacksonville Zoo uh, at a zoo. What could go wrong and how would we, what would we do to address the impacts? What would, what would need to happen in order to, um, in order to mitigate, respond and recovery uh, for those particular types of disasters? So uh, this was something that when I first started it, they were like, we're gonna have a doom and gloom meeting. Yes, we're gonna have a doom and gloom meeting. And it was a brainstorm session where we wrote some things down and added it to our plan. Uh, and it was a great way of, really walking through some scenarios and figuring out who needs to do what if something like this were to happen. And it was a great way for us just to get some ideas out there as well. Also, I'm very big proponent of looking at con continuity of operation plan for businesses as well. There's a lot of templates out there for this. FEMA actually has a very good template that I've used in the past as well. And it basically uh, not only looks at the preparation side as well, but it looks at how do you continue operations, especially um, after a disaster or a hazard for your business? What are the steps that need to happen? And of course, you plan for this ahead of time in order to try to get back, back to business uh, as much as possible after a disaster. And again, this is a recommendation of looking at something maybe every six months or right after a disaster, but I would say at least twice a year. And again, if something were to happen, you'd want to update it or if there's been a change within your organization, you want to make sure that that information is updated as well. And then as we go for, you know, we talked about individual and family, we talked about organization, now looking at community planning. And we talked a little bit about this capacity planning, uh, capacity building that session too as well, but looking at that whole community approach and building capacity within the communities and looking at within the neighborhoods, the schools, places of worship, even mobile online, especially right now in the times that we're living in with COVID, I feel like we're doing more and more mobile online and more and more folks are coming up with unique ways to try to connect mobile online as well. But how do we build those capacities within neighborhoods, schools, and places of worships to have that whole community approach uh, to preparedness within our whole community as well? Collaborate to address anticipate needs and gaps. Uh, this is uh, something that I've talked about earlier as well, but being able to collaborate with other organizations to look at those needs and gaps, especially if you have unique target audiences or similar missions that you'd be able to come together to try to, to anticipate some of the needs and gaps from disasters as well. Developing a community plan and developing a network, using some of those bonds within your own communities, but how do you build bridges with those outside of your own communities, within other counties or within other organizations uh, that you can be able to share resources or develop some best management practices, or again, looking at how to address some of these needs that may arise if a disaster were to impact the community as well but also looking at those links. And if we remember correctly, those links actually go vertically. So you can have uh, maybe a neighborhood that's working together with a community organization to try to address a need within their particular area as well. So they're more kind of a hierarchical, links are more hierarchical than bridges and bonds are. Uh, like organizations can, uh, can collaborate and they share resources, develop plans. Collaborations across organizations are at all levels and you try to reach out to partners within the community to reach some of those broader audiences as well. So um, coming together as, as different organizations can be really effective, especially in trying to reach broader audiences sometimes as well. So uh, another quick question for y'all. So in thinking about some of these different plannings and thinking about the unique challenges of a military family, what do y'all think are some of the barriers to planning? to making plans, doing plans. Too busy, yes, mm -hmm. time. Other barriers, uncertainty of how long you'll be living in a certain area. Oh gosh, yeah, that is definitely a unique challenge, absolutely. Time and workload, denial, yes. Some people feel it as being too negative. That's a great point, Tamara. Not wanting to deal with it. Yep. Lack of interest by family, accessibility, denial, fear, interest, yes. Family plans, not consider community plan, okay. 
procrastinating. Yes, I'm jealous. I, I'm guilty of that as well. Absolutely. Great. These are some great barriers. Absolutely. And all of these are very true. Time, equipment, materials, knowledge, living on life on autopilot as well. These are some great responses. Thank y'all very much. Angie, and one I, of the things that was said yes. in the comments there um, by Lisa a little bit earlier before you asked that question, she was describing a scenario in which I think her chain of command or, or somewhere in her leadership um, took, it, took it out of the I'd like to do it, but I don't have time uh, mode and into the you must do it. And she described some interesting preparations that they had to do, in, including being ready to go two miles on foot and needing to create a go bag so that she would be or her family would be able to move out in the event that they needed to. So one, one thing to think about here, I think, is the importance of socializing that this isn't a nice to do. It's something that you, you need to do. Um, and that's something for, I think, all of us working with military families to think about. How do we, how do we continue to make this um, not a nice to do that we wished we would have done when the blue skies went away, but instead make that a priority for us? So if you, you have any thoughts or, or hints or suggestions on how we, how we socialize this in the positive and get it done, uh, I think all of us are open, open to hearing that. I think that's a great point. I'm really glad to hear that uh, they did that. Yeah. Uh, Lisa had here that boss created an emergency bag for all staff, staff members. Like this is fantastic. And in case we ever had to shelter in place for weather, um, I, I'm, I'm, I'd love to hear that. I think it's a, a great idea. I know. Um, and I will say, and I think I talk about it a little bit. Um, I think I'm a little bit talking about a couple of slides here, but exercises and doing drills uh, are great ways to uh, make it kind of top of mind for folks a little bit. And I mean, a lot of the barriers that y'all talked about of lack of interest and is, I mean, for here in Florida, like November 30th comes and everyone's like, well, we made it through that one. Um, and hurricanes really aren't mentioned throughout the year uh, from, from December to end of May. Uh, you start hearing about it around May as well. But I think having some of the like the exercises and the drills that are planned throughout the year uh, so that it, it is top of the mind as well. Uh, I really like that. One of the things that we have done in the past um, in working with organizations and working with businesses is we included some of the, it wasn't just a, hey, this is a crisis committee that's going to work on putting a plan for us. Our suggestion was that we need the top administration involved with this because if we have the top administration involved in and that they're bought in basically to developing a crisis plan and making sure that their their staff is prepared and the organization is prepared as well, then folks are going to see that culture of preparedness as well. So, uh, you know, a lot of organizations and businesses, yeah, I've got a crisis committee that I put together. I would encourage it to be a whole organization and especially the including that top administration in there so that it becomes a top priority, not only for the individuals that are on the committee, but also for the uh, top administration and for everyone involved as well. So I, these are some great ideas that folks are putting in here as well. Angie, uh, also in the comments, I know um, we, we want to move on and see, see what else you've got, but there was a question in there about uh, preparation tips and planning and preparedness tips for individuals in wheelchairs. Um, I, I, I know that our Extension Disaster Education Network, especially some of the work that's been done in the New York uh, extension system has some information on that, which I'll place in the chat. But do you have any any thoughts on preparing for di disaster for for people with disabilities and other special needs? So I do. Um, and, and actually, when I finish up, uh, Keith, I'll pull some because we have some uh, down here in Florida, obviously, with our uh, with some of our population being older as well. Uh, the several commissions here in Florida have uh, some materials on how best to to prepare for individuals with within wheelchairs or with physical disabilities as well. I think it I want to think it's our Office of Elder Affairs here in Florida I have some really great resources that I'll put in the chat box when I'm done here as well. Also, um, I feel like the ADA as well. I've, I know I feel like I've looked to some places also um, from their resources also. That's a great question, though. 
Okay, so I'll continue on. I really like this picture, by the way. Uh, but overcoming some of those initial barriers to planning. So it, again, we kind of just talked about this now and some great conversations through the chat as well, including some of these conversations throughout the year. I've uh, been looking at planning and disaster planning. Look at some case studies. Case studies are great ways in order to uh, look at what was done uh, in other areas. How would we have handled it differently? Uh, looking at what's happened with other organizations or with other communities. Hey, you know, they just went through a tornado that impacted their organization or their family. What, what would we do if that happened to us? So look at some of the case studies that are already out there. And there's some great case studies that are uh, provided simply just uh, online in a lot of places. But look at some of those that are happening around the country as well, where you hear about it on the news or something. Take a few minutes to kind of talk with your family or talk with your organization about what would we do if this happened to us? So look for those opportunities to start the conversation as well. And then providing, um, providing readily accessible resources as well. These can be some that you come up with in your own organization or share others. And again, there's so many great resources out there and Keith mentioned ready.gov and there's several others out there also. Consider templates and then also consider some videos or workshops as well. Uh, and these can be something that, you know, short videos that can be on YouTube or, um, or Venmo or what not Venmo or but but look at those pretty quickly. And so that folks can get the general information and they may, may take that information and do their own thing or a video with a template. So look at different ways. And again, know your audience, know how best they like to receive information and try to meet them where they are with this types of information as well. And then I also mentioned, I knew it was on a slide somewhere, uh, consider an exercise or drill. Cause I mean, the minute you say exercise or drill, especially within your organization, I'm sure you'll get a lot of eye rolls and a lot of, oh my gosh, we don't have time for this. But what that does is it sets up a tone of that crisis preparedness and, oh my gosh, what would we do if this happened? And it starts people thinking about what they would do. And it gives it a chance again, to start that conversation and to come together to think about these things. Right. Okay. And then also, I mean, this, this is basic. Communicate the four W's and the H of planning, the who, what, when, where, and how of planning as well. So kind of want to just go through these pretty quickly. So why prepare? We kind of know that the biggest breakdown in disaster efforts a lot of times is communication. Uh, I've attended a lot of hot washes here in, in Florida. And a lot of times what you hear about of what, what did not go well was there was a breakdown of communication. So being able to have some of this communication before a disaster or talking through how will we communicate if this goes down or if this goes down uh, is going to be really beneficial and looking at some of that response and recovery efforts as well. Also, keep in mind, these are stressful situations and, all, and, and we're all very smart people and we all um, have common sense and we are like, oh, we know what to do in the time of a disaster. And, and many of us absolutely do. However, this is a stressful situation and your adrenaline is pumping, you're in reactive mode. So you may not be thinking as clearly as you, as you would be in, in a time that you're not faced with a hazard or disaster or impacts to your family or your home. So think about the importance of planning in that situation. So yes, absolutely. I think many of us know exactly what we do in a time of disaster and we're able to think through it very clearly right now when we're not in the midst of it. But when it's actually happening and you're in reactive mode and your adrenaline is pumping, you may not be thinking as clearly. So having something on a piece of paper that you can look at quickly that reminds you of what you've talked about back then can be really helpful. Provide, provides a roadmap and everything's in one place so you don't have to go searching for things and that would add to stress as well. So why prepare? Obviously lessen impacts from disasters and think about uh, the complex disasters that we're having now with COVID-19 and cascading events. Uh, some of these disasters tend to lead to other disasters as well. So as much as we can plan for disasters that we maybe are more familiar with in global pandemics, hopefully they can lessen some of the impacts that we have from complex disasters like having COVID-19 on top of some of these natural disasters or cascading events uh, such as maybe some of these financial impacts that we're having from the complex disasters such as COVID-19 and natural disasters in addition to a uh, global pandemic as well. So uh, just a preparation as much beforehand can hopefully lessen some of these impacts. Maybe not do away with them, obviously, but lessen them, hopefully. So who should prepare? Everybody. 
uh, and ensure that everyone does know the plan as well. Encourage whole family planning. I think someone said in the chat box, family's uninterested. I I have three boys and two of them are teenagers. And so y'all can imagine the amount of no, not interested <laughs> in looking at the family disaster plan that I received. So yeah, so a lot of times it's, it's difficult to get everyone on board, but I think it's so important to try to encourage the whole family and the importance of talking through some of these. And then make sure that you include those family members who need special assistance. Some things that we talked about here in Florida being hurricane season is that uh, those individuals, uh, maybe some older fo folks within your, within your family that cannot evacuate to a shelter because of the risk of COVID-19, making sure that you make plans ahead of them for them ahead of time so that you don't put them at risk, number one, for the natural, for the natural hazard, but also at risk for COVID-19. So trying to think through some of the family members that may need special assistance as well. And then I would um, encourage everyone to communicate and share those plans, uh, not only with your within your own family, but with folks that are maybe outside of your family. And the, for family members that don't live within your same state or live outside, to make sure you share this plan with them so that they are aware as well. Okay, so let's look at some. So these are just some of the templates, and I, I love these that um, that many of these different uh, branches have these templates that are readily readily available for folks to to fill out and download and to use these as templates in developing their own emergency plan. So, uh, but I I encourage everyone to think about when you say how how to develop a plan and to not get caught up in the putting together a plan because that can be a little bit overwhelming. Uh, and when you think about I'm we're going to put together a plan, don't let it be overwhelming. You know, number one, these are not for a grade. And uh, no one else can see them outside of your family. You're not going to turn them into anyone specifically. These are this is something for your family and what's best best suits your family's needs and gaps. Uh, it does not have to be visually appealing. It doesn't have to be pretty, uh, and it just needs to be useful. It needs to be something that is useful for the members within your family uh, and that can help you out in in the time of a crisis as well. There are some great templates out there, such as this one as well, uh, but don't feel like you have to use a template. You could use it as a guide and get out a legal pad and make up your own. So um, again, I'm, when, when I talk with people about preparedness, I said, don't, don't get overwhelmed with, I have to put together a plan. Because I think a lot of folks think, well, I have to put together a plan. It has to be this beautiful plan that we have to put together. And, and it doesn't have to be. It has to be something that works for you and your family as well. And just some other great um, tools that are out there, templates and tools, you know, what to prepare. A lot of times that depends on your family, a written plan, disaster kits, or at least a checklist of what needs to go into a disaster kit. Checklist are great tools. Um, I really like some of the checklists and I have an example in a few minutes I'll show you. Important numbers, any kind of important documents, and this includes uh, keeping, keeping those important documents on a thumb drive or making sure you have copies of them as well. So thinking through some of these, uh, putting together plans and some of the uniqueness of military families, what are some of the special steps um, that they should take in order, in order to develop some of these plans for themselves? What are, what are some special things that, that uniqueness of military families should take in order to put some of these things together? anyone have any you can put these in the chat box sorry i didn't i didn't say chat box sorry y'all power of attorneys oh that's a great one kathy yes there was some comments in the chat earlier about being aware of scammers especially in the uh um well not so much in the preparation stage which we're talking about now but once we get to the recovery phase but i suppose you need to be prepared for being able to suss through what's real and what's not uh, so that you're ready for that uh, when it's recovery time. That's a really great point. That was something um, that we were doing after Hurricane Irma, especially with contractors. Uh, extension agents were using their phones to check contractors. Um, that was some the community members were like, I don't know if this guy is real or legit or what. So that was something that our extension folks were doing was, was going to the Better Business Bureau to make sure that these folks were licensed and certified that were out there trying to you know, offer to, to, to fix folks' roofs or whatever. So that's a really great point. List of medication, important documents, keeping safe. Yes. 
important resources like American Red Cross deployment. These are great. Paper prescriptions. Yes. Cash. Cash. Yes. That's a very good one, Steve. Document recovery. Having an out-of-state contact list too. Absolutely. Um, yeah, Bridget, that's a good point of downloading. You know, if cell service goes down, you really can't, act, you sometimes can't access your contact list on your cell phone. So printing out that contact list from your cell phone b before a hazard can be really helpful. So you have those numbers there on hand. If you're like me, I can't remember a number anymore. <laughs> okay, so looking at disaster kits, uh, this is a great uh uh, infographic from CDC as well. 48% do not have, 48% of folks do not have an emergency supply. 50, 52% do not have copies of their personal documents and 44% do not have first aid kits as well. So the importance of planning, not only having that written plan as well, but having some of these supplies and documents and first aid kits is so important as well. And this is just an example of some of the disaster kits. That, that particular checklist there to the left is from ready.gov, the green check mark there. And this is an example of a disaster checklist. I like this one. This one's from Save the Children. It's a, it's a, great, uh, it's a great example. These can be part of your plan. Uh, there's something that you can review pretty quickly. It provides for not missing a step in your, in your preparations to, for a hazard or a disaster. Um, it provides steps for evacuating if that's what you need to do and includes an entire family. Uh, and one of the things that we like to recommend is these types of checklists can be laminated and something that you can use a dry erase marker and just check off as you go on and then wipe it clean and then use it again for the next one. So I think these are check, checklists are really important um, parts of the plan as well. And then I kind of already talked about the important phone numbers on hand, especially if they're in your cell phone, make sure that you try to get those printed out beforehand so that you have them uh, readily available and you don't have to rely on your cell phone because as many of us know, cell, fire, cell towers go down, but also uh, when the electricity is out, chargers uh, can, no, you can't, you can't charge your phone sometimes. So uh, your phone may be dead as well. And important critical documents, and this is individual based upon your family and some of the unique challenges you have, but this can include your insurance policy, financial documents, um, any kind of information you have regarding medical records, et cetera. And again, they can be put in a waterproof case or on a thumb drive that you can carry with you as well. And there's some cash and somebody said that passports as well. So when should you prepare? I would say you would want to encourage families to pick a time when all family members will be home and schedule a check-in every few months to ensure plan is up to date. And so again, do not develop a plan for it to sit on a shelf. This should be a living and breathing document uh, that should be updated as your things in your family change. Think about cell phone numbers change, et cetera. This should be something that uh, should live and breathe and be something that does not just sit on a shelf as well. And I know many of y'all said that y'all do you do check-ins every couple of months with your plans and that that's awesome. Disasters are often the best teaching moments. Take moments after disasters that you um, have yourself experienced, debrief and update the plan, uh, what worked, what did not work. But again, and I talked about this before, look for other examples to learn from and this can be within, within your community or with other individuals and other families, but can also be things that you hear about on the news of, hey, it's kind of a conversation starter. What would we do in this situation? Be mindful of disasters in other communities, discuss as a family what you would have done also. And then military family, uh, when relocating, become familiar with disasters in the area and update disaster plan and kit accordingly. So I'm from the Southeast. And so if I moved somewhere with a tornado, I would have no idea. So I would definitely want to become familiar with some of those emergency numbers and disaster response in that area. And especially if you're stationed abroad as well. And I also encourage here, especially for uh, military families to be familiar with the plans at each installation. And those templates are available at each, um, at each of the installations as well as each branch has templates. And I showed some screenshots of some of the ones earlier. So be familiar with those plans that, that are already out there and readily available as templates also. And then also just some of the, um, and this is the one, the first one here is the one Keith was talking about, the ready.gov backslash military. Be aware of some of the resources and protocol for branches of military. And just many of y'all, I'm sure, already know about a lot of these as well. 
Um, also want to include talking about children. Uh, Ready Kids is a program by ready.gov. It's a great program. Uh, and so these are programs that encourage kids to plan. Many of these programs are done at school. They talk to kids about making plans within their school. And then the kids come home and bring it to their parents. And again, encourage that conversation, encourage the families to sit down and plan uh, because the kids already have a great template there that they developed at school through this Ready Kids program. Also, there's veterans programs after disasters and then connect with the local community what resources are available within their communities and this can be military service organizations or veteran service organization and then also a lot of times after disasters you have come community long-term recovery groups and these develop in, in impacted communities as well and then lastly other resources are obviously extension uh, look, look to your local extension service within your county and your state there's lots of great resources involved in there as well so uh, as we're kind of wrapping up here, I just kind of want to talk about, you know, it's hard to say, okay, everybody take out a piece of paper, we're going to develop a disaster plan. But I did want to talk about some of the key components and foundations that you'll find in a lot of these plans. And a lot of them is a meeting place. Uh, you have a meeting place within your neighborhood, within regional, uh, in case you do get separated. What are some of the crucial numbers out of, out of town contacts, especially with other family members, in town contacts, school, work information, medical information, as well as insurance policy information. And this can include medical insurance as well as home insurance. Um, and any property insurance you have as well. And then family information, cell phone for each person if they folks have cell phones, uh, grandparents' cell phones, et cetera, making sure you have those cell phone information, date of birth, social security number, medical history, and uh, any kind of medical or any kind of prescriptions, et cetera, that these folks may have. So last question I'm gonna ask for y'all to answer here in this uh, particular uh, session is what elements, uh, what are elements that need to be in a disaster plan for military families? These were kind of the foundation. So what do y'all think needs to be, what specific may need to be in there for military families? Oh, Dan and yes, Dan, toilet paper, definitely. Um, Kathy, uh, sanitizing and personal grooming things. Absolutely. Washcloth towel. Those are great. Anything else that y'all think would need to be in a plan? Care for pets, yes. And there's some great care for pets out there too. Uh, great templates out there for pets as well. Medications, yes, good point, Keith. Medicines list, absolutely. Emergency contacts, yes, emergency contacts. And that's a good point, uh, Lisa, of making sure that you had uh, money as well as it's emergency contacts are there folks within the county that you need to make sure that uh, you connect with or within the city. Evacuation routes, good point. Communication plan, communicating with a person. Batteries, POC, good. Batteries is a good one. Consider home and deployment ceremonies, our contact person of disaster area. Great points, everyone. And lastly, I just wanted to provide some resources. I did have one more that I will put in the chat here. It's called the Homeowner Handbook. Uh, it's something that the Gulf uh, states have done in connection with extension and the Sea Grant. Uh, and it's actually fairly new. And there's one for each state. There's one for Texas, Mississippi, Alabama, Louisiana, and Florida. So I'll put that in the chat box as well so that everyone has access to it. I, this, the one I'll post in there is Florida, but you can find it for all the Gulf Coast states as well. Okay, so Keith, I think I'm gonna hand it back over to you to introduce our next speaker. Thanks very much, a very fascinating presentation and also lots of interesting comments and, and thoughts in the chat. Um, we'll continue the conversation now. Uh, please continue to have uh, additional conversation in the, in the chat. And I'd like to now uh, introduce Nancy Beers who's the director of the Center for Disaster Philanthropy's Midwest Early Recovery Fund. Nancy, thank you so much for being here today. And uh, perhaps you'd like to share with us some thoughts based on what you've heard this morning. Uh, and, um, and after that, perhaps we could have a little conversation and, and bring in some of the comments that are coming in uh, in the chat. Thank you so much and good afternoon, morning, evening to whoever, wherever you are all today. I'm in Minnesota today and it's a beautiful day, believe it or not, in Minnesota. I can talk Norwegian all day for you. I, I, I love Angie's accent, by the way. I have a completely different accent. Um, thank you. I, I learned, you know, I always learn from when I learn about preparedness too. That is not my area of expertise, um, obviously. 
Um, I'm an expert um, or a, a specialist in disaster recovery work. I've been doing that for about 20 years. Um, I used to work for faith-based organizations that did this work uh, consistently across the Midwest. And now I have this opportunity at the Center for Disaster Philanthropy to be working with other philanthropists uh, across the country, especially community foundations and large family foundations, um, trying to help them understand uh, where do you invest in disaster work and what's the right place um, for your portfolio uh, that you might be interested in people with mental health disabilities, you might be interested in children, et cetera. And we help organizations understand um, where they should invest. As we talk about preparedness, I think that challenge for most people around preparing for recovery is that most people don't really understand recovery very well and how it works and, and what the challenges are in recovery. And the main reason I believe for that, and we have evidence of that um, from some research from the Center for Disaster Philanthropy, is that we often get our information from the television about disasters. And television um, is attracted by catastrophic events, right? And so, you know, you might have a big flood. For example, there was a huge derecho in Iowa this year. It was the largest thunderstorm in United States history. And yet most of us didn't really hear about it. Um, and yet it was a huge, it was like a hur uh, inland hurricane uh, that with no, with no warning and 8,000 homes were impacted. But we, but even if you heard about it, you only heard about what happened in the first week or two weeks, even sometimes if a disaster is serious enough, you might even hear a follow-up story on CNN sometime later about what happened to particular people in that community. But we don't often understand that disaster recovery lasts a very long time. And I think Katrina probably is the best example for our country as um, a disaster that continued to make the press for a long time. And people got frustrated trying to understand why it took so long and why things weren't happening in a timely manner. And so I'm hoping to take a few minutes here to help you understand through a couple of case studies that I, pre I prepared, but also a little bit of additional information on how recovery actually works in, in a community. And um, so that you can prepare, because I believe that you can't prepare for something you don't understand. And you have to also, those of you who are in the social service organizations or, or if you're working actually with clients or whatever, you're probably going to have to understand a bit about the impact of what recovery does to individuals so that you can help them access the resources they need. So I'm just going to read the very first sentence from my, my, um, my case study because I, that's where I want to start. But the rest of it, I'll just sort of highlight the um, parts I think I need. But recovery is the most complicated and costly and under-resourced phase of the disaster cycle. It is complex, uh, layered, and involves multiple agencies and endes, uh, entities. And depending on the severity of the impact, it can last for years. So I don't know if you've seen the little uh, phases of disaster um, diagram I have on my case study. But it's really important to look at that if you get a chance, because we pretty much understand that pre-disaster, the planning part. I think we kind of know who does that um, in our community or our organizationally. We take responsibility to do that on our own, right? Um, or you might take, uh, you might have a mandate to do that within your organization. But preparing for recovery is not as simple sometimes as people hope it would be. And so what we know about recovery is that there starts to be this disillusionment, this, this kind of feeling like I'm a victim instead of a survivor, that I'm not quite sure, I feel like my neighbor is recovering, but I'm not. And there's a lot of things that exacerbate that. Um, and we'll talk about how I think that uh, particularly impacts military families in just a couple of minutes. But you know, we understand perhaps in our communities who's supposed to fix the roads and the bridges and get the trees cleaned up, and which can, by the way, be very, very expensive for individuals. Um, they're up to like four or five thousand dollars to remove a tree. So if you don't have insurance for that, you're in trouble, right? Just right off the bat. But if you, it, it's it's really not just about repairing infrastructure. It's really about helping families go home and not just go home, but go home in a place that they're gonna that's sustainable and that they're healthy and that they're going to be contributors to society as they move on. 
Um, FEMA, of course, is the major player in disaster recovery work. Um, if you get a FEMA declaration, as some of you probably know, there's several different kinds of declarations, a PA, which helps with public infrastructure, and IA, which helps with individual assistance. You can get an SBA loan. Um, some states have um, alternate programs uh, that, that supplement FEMA. But FEMA is a really important partner. And what the Center for Disaster Philanthropy knows is that about 95%, between 90 and 95% of all the money that you need to recover after a disaster, if you have lost personal property, a car, your home, whatever, um, comes from FEMA or insurance. But if you don't have a FEMA declaration, an IA declaration, you're really starting at a deficit. Many of our more rural communities, our smaller communities, especially during um, kind of more um, specific location specific events like tornadoes, et cetera, that don't um, get a take, a take a wide swath. Those, those people in that community were impacted as if it had taken a wide swath, but they're often um, under resourced because um, it, it wasn't big enough to get a declaration from the federal government. But what I know is um, disasters happen, whether you're prepared or not, right? Um, we can do everything we can to prepare, but disasters still happen. So it's really not just about preparing for an event, but really understanding how an event might impact you or your family long-term so that you can prepare for that. Uh, one of the other things I just wanted to mention is that what we're seeing more and more of in this country, I've been at this for 20 years, like I said before, is that um, we're seeing more major rain events and they can happen anywhere at any time. So if you get 12 inches of rain or 18 inches of rain in a short period of time, even if you're not in a floodplain, if the area you're living in has never been flooded ever, you can still have major flooding in your area. But oftentimes those are the places that people are most unprepared. Um, and then I think it's really important also for me to tell you these stories about specific clients so that you can understand how it impacts uh, your clients specifically or the people you work with specifically or yourself specifically so that you can understand what are the things that you need to do to prepare for that. Um, obviously, one of the most important things you can do to prepare is have your own insurance. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about people who did not have insurance, but I just wanted to mention that, you know, those of us in the recovery field would tell you that insurance is the biggest problem we have in disasters because 90% of all people, FEMA, FEMA says that 90% of all people who are flooded, and flooding is the biggest disaster in the United States, 90% of those people are uninsured or underinsured, most uninsured. And in, der in derechos or tornadoes or wildfires or home fires or even hurricanes, if you have to have, if you live in a hurricane prone area, you have to have hurricane insurance. For uh, most people aren't required um, to have on their mortgage flood insurance unless they live in a floodplain or a floodway. And that is, that's an issue, right? Because if people aren't, don't have insurance and their home is flooded, uh, since FEMA only gives you, uh, I think the max grant right now is $39,400, you can't repair a home for $39,000. And where are you gonna get the rest of the money if you don't have insurance? Um, so I, uh, my case study is about a flood I did in 2007 in Minnesota. It was the largest flood in Minnesota history at that time. It impacted many areas, but a lot of small rural communities that were, uh, the one that I particularly worked in for a long time had been mitigated. And so no one was required to have flood insurance because there had been a large Army Corps of Engineers project there in the 80s uh, to make sure flooding wouldn't happen, but nobody could predict it, that they were gonna get about 20 inches of rain in 24 hours and the creeks and everything flooded, made their own dams. When the dams broke, they flooded large areas of land. Um, I met a young couple there who, um, she was pregnant. Um, they were having their third baby and their home had been completely destroyed into, up to the second floor. And their challenges were multiple, as you can only imagine. Um, they didn't have, they didn't have any clothing. They didn't have food. They didn't have anything. And there are people in the beginning that are wonderful and they come and they help people and they give them cash and they'll provide food and they'll have community meals and they'll, they'll hand out clothing. And there's all these wonderful things that happen, but those people leave. And what we know from disaster recovery work is that it ends up, it's the community that does the work. It's your own community and the nonprofits and the city government and the people that matter in that community 
who help the community recover. They might get resources from outside sources like myself, and we offer a lot of technical support. But at the end of the day, you're really dependent on the citizens in your community to help you recover. And so this young couple was really struggling and it took us a couple of years to get them um, a home. They didn't have insurance. We had to get a lot of volunteers together. We had to get a whole cadre, a tapestry of resources to get them help. But at the end of the day, they did pretty good. They lived in a FEMA trailer in Minnesota in the winter. That's not a good idea. And we had a lot of huge heat bills and we had to help them pay their heat bills during the winter. We often had to make sure that, um, that they had daycare that might have disappeared. Um, and the other thing is that, and we're going to get to this a little bit more, and I saw a lot of comments about this in the chat room, but disaster is traumatizing. And those people who have a different um, circumstances in their life, pre-disaster situations, pre-disaster vulnerabilities are especially prone to um, a difficult recovery because it becomes overwhelming and they don't become good decision makers. And one of the reasons we have long-term recovery groups and disaster case managers, for example, and nonprofit groups working in communities is to help those individuals on a one-on-one -on -one basis recover from disasters. Um, I also met, uh, the case study is also about a military family that I met and that um, was really struggling with their recovery. They'd gone into debt. Um, at, at a time where they thought it was perfectly fine in their late 40s and early 50s, thinking that they'd put a second mortgage on their house and, and do some repairs to their home and do some things that they wanted to do for a long time and finally felt they were at a place where they could do this. Their son was um, in the military. He was overseas. Um, and that made the wife even a, um, a bit more vulnerable to what was going on. And she really struggled. And what we often see with people who after disasters, they continue to tell their story over and over and over again. And I had a psychologist tell me one time that's because people tell their story until they believe it themselves. And that she just couldn't accept the fact that this was the way her life was gonna be moving forward. And again, with a lot of help and a lot of community support and a lot of partners, we found ways to get them home, but it took them over two years to get their house back and for them to move home. In the meantime, they were living on people's, on other people's couches. They had rented a place for a while, um, all kinds of things like that. But um, there, I just want everyone to know that there's a lot of nonprofits that come in and help, but they're not your typical nonprofits that you're probably used to. The Red Cross um, has, as you all know, um, absolutely um, became less community focused over time as they took their um, a lot of their satellite offices out of community. And so the Red Cross is not really present in the community like it used to be. I, I can tell you that's very different from, I'd say 2010 to 2020. And the Salvation Army is another typical partner that we typically um, uh, depend on greatly after disaster. But a lot of these agencies are now really struggling with financial support and continuity of, inf of, of operations in the time, especially now of COVID. I could talk all day about how COVID has exacerbated disaster recovery in our country, but it's a real challenge and it's uh, COVID and any other, um, any other thing that can layer on to disaster recovery just makes recovery harder and longer. And I just wanted to talk really briefly, my time is almost up here, but uh, briefly about what I think how this is, what I've been a witness to and how it's impacted military families particularly. Um, I've seen partners um, at home alone when their partner has been deployed. They can get bitter about that. They feel alone. Um, it's typically wives, but not always, of course, but typically wives who are home alone with their children trying to figure out this on their own. We see that a lot with single family parents as well. And it can be overwhelming. You still have to go to work. You still have to, you still have to take care of your kids. You still have to get food on the table every night. And yet here you are really feeling alone in a very difficult situation. Um, retired vets. Unfortunately, what we know about a lot of retired vets, at least in my region, is they have a lot of pre-existing trauma. And so what we see after disaster is this can be an overwhelming situation for people who have a lot of pre-existing trauma to get really to just kind of get a plan together in this ability to move forward, this ability to figure out how to put the pieces back together again, because it's not like one resource is going to help you. You're going to have to multitask. You're going to have to look for multiple resources over time. Um, 
usually vet offices, uh, do, veteran offices, at least in the state of Minnesota, where I've done most of my work, um, offer um, cash uh, donations to veterans. So our case managers often can get like $250,000, uh, $250, we wish, $250 for clients um, to help them recover. Um, that can often be a resource that's available, but we don't often, uh, vets don't often come to the community and offer that. Um, we have to kind of find that out uh, as case managers. Um, veterans might not know the, their state city government very well, right? They might have been moved. They might be uh, new to the community. It might be a place that they've never lived before. And so not really understanding how the infrastructure within your community works might be a real challenge to them. Um, they might be new to the community and they're not really connected to that social framework that really matters after a disaster. One of the things I always say about rural communities is they have so, more social cohesiveness often. So sometimes their recoveries are either uh, pretty, you know, they're pretty good. But also what we know about the Midwest, for example, is we have a lot of vulnerable populations that aren't necessarily identified for the, from the leaders that are in their community. So oftentimes we need to uh, point those out and who those people are. And then the other thing that's really important to understand is kind of sometimes most often disaster is very different for renters and homeowners. So uh, homeowners are really have the burden of repairing their home. And it's up to them to repair their home. It's their home. And they need the resources to do that. So that's not really a government's job. It's really an individual's job to repair their home. Renters on the other side become displaced. And they become displaced. You might, might be in competition. If you become displaced after a, a flood or something, your landowner, you're completely dependent on your landowner's ability or will to repay, recover and repair your property in, in a timely manner, which might not happen. And then after disaster, rental properties become premium because all these homeowners are also looking for rental properties while their homes are, are being repaired. So oftentimes uh, people can be really displaced and not really have a place to live and often move home, you know, leave their home or their place where they were living and, and move in with family in a place that they weren't um, they weren't necessarily living before. So it can really be a challenge, especially for military families who might be living in a, a, a temporary place. It's not a long-term commitment to that place. They might not have that social cohesion that they really need to recover. Back to you. Very interesting. There's a lot of chat going on here uh, in, in relation to your, your case study. I think one of the things that really stands out to me, uh, Nancy, is, is the comment that you made sort of earlier in your remarks regarding the importance of community and their support. And that, of course, relates to many of our, uh, those of us that are working with military families or have served in the military are familiar with this term community capacity building. So mm -hmm. I'm interested in, um, from your perspective and from the, from the standpoint from which you work, what, what can you say more about community capacity building and, and how that might relate specifically to this audience, those that are working with military families uh, and, and providing those resources to them? What can, what can these providers, educators, practitioners learn uh, from your experiences regarding uh, uh, community capacity building as it relates to disaster recovery? That's such a good question because that's exactly what I do for a living. So um, we go in and build community capacity after disasters, and we do that with a lot of technical support, right? A lot of people don't understand how to how to create a long-term recovery group. They might not understand who the players should be at the table, et cetera. And then we actually give them funding to uh, develop those re the, that capacity. So right now we're really investing a lot in disaster recovery coordinators, even around COVID. Disaster recovery coordinator is somebody who's kind of a neutral party, probably works for the United Way. Sometimes they work for the Red Cross. Sometimes they work for the Salvation Army, whatever those major partners are in your community. Um, but community ca capacity really ends up having to be built after a disaster. I, I mean, I wish we could say this is a pre-disaster capacity building. What we know from my work particularly is the foundations, the community foundations, the United Way, some of those partners that holistically deal with community capacity building on an everyday basis. We're working very hard to educate them now on how to build capacity after disasters, which can be a different beast, right? It's just a different thing that you might not have ever had to do before. And it might be new to you, but it's 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 not that dissimilar from build uh, from building your capacity around another stressor, right? Like in in the Midwest, for example, we have a lot meat, a lot of meatpacking plants that now are actually employ about 
75% of, of new Americans or Latinx communities. And communities are having to prepare differently, right? Because they have a lot of people in their communities who don't speak English, it's not their first language. Um, and again, of course, with what we got going on now with schools and COVID, um, technology is a challenge, right? So building the capacity around your community about, as someone said earlier about communications is really important after disaster, but I would say post-disaster post communications are just as important. And it's really hard to have that kind of transparency that the community needs because there's so many meetings that are going on behind closed doors to uh, figure out complex problems. But one of the things we um, really do is we talk to our nonprofit partners in those communities who are already working with vulnerable populations and help them understand how to build their capacity. And sometimes it's intellectual property. Interesting, yes. So, so it strikes me, uh, Nancy, that some of the things you're saying relate directly to some of the comments we heard from Angie previously regarding bonds and uh, bonds and bridges, uh, and especially in the last session, Angie talked about that. Angie, would you would you like to comment on the relationship between this community capacity discussion we're having with Nancy's case study and uh, your thoughts on bonds and bridges? Sure, absolutely. I'm. Uh, and, I, you know, bonds and bridges are so important. Like Nancy was saying, you know, the recovery is happening within the nonprofit groups and the community organizations within the group. And that absolutely is, is so true. And we've seen it in recovery here in Florida as well. And I think it's just important to, you know, a lot of times those bonds are, are with, with some of those organizations, but also looking at those organizations that reach across different counties and reach across regionally as well, because they are helping us also. So maybe not, maybe those that you're not as familiar with within mm -hmm. your own community but look uh look at some of these regional ones also i mean i know for instance when i worked with susan g Komen, i had a seven county region so even though i was based out of one particular place my my coverage area was much larger than that so thinking about making those bridges even though that organization may not be you know right there within your community they may still be part you may still be part of their particular region and so it's important to build bridges with those as well yeah, and can I just add that I think our extension offices, especially in the Midwest where I work, do about 80% of my work in the Midwest, um, our extension offices are great resources afterwards. They've got all kinds of tools and training and all kinds of, and we always connect our long-term recovery groups with the extension office. We want the extension office often on that long-term recovery group if possible. I love that you brought that up and that was not even prompted. That's one of my- uh, I know, thank you, Nancy. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> We, we really That's want what I got to, in this uh, call. I know, I know them in Minnesota. We, we want to drive home the value of cooperative extension as a sort of force multiplier mm -hmm. in this in this space for for military families, uh, and 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 especially in the disaster context, as Angie has been describing in these past three sessions, the extension disaster education network and its its many resources are a great resource for everybody on this on this uh, session today. Mm -hmm. um, another another. Uh, question. Uh, there's, there's some talk about, um, you know, post-disaster uh, capacity building and the, the need for, you know, open lines of communication uh, regarding, you know, um, especially sort of populations that may be uh, vulnerable or disadvantaged or, 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 you know, special needs and those kinds of things. In your experience, and, and you've had a lot of experience, uh, what what do you see as some of the best things that folks can do in preparation for those sorts of challenges, uh, especially in the in the context of special needs or, or caregiving situations? Good question. You know, what I guess I would say is that, and I I, I don't want to I don't want this to sound like a Debbie Downer moment. I, and my kids say, please, mom, put the Debbie Downer stuff. But um, what I what I can what I can be honest about is that not every community is equal, and not every community is going to do the things for individuals that we would hope they would do, and so it's really important to not just know who your city government people are and your and and and, and the people that typically you would expect to repair things, um, or help or bring resources to your community. But we find that during the long road back to recovery is your nonprofit partners are really important and your community foundations are really important, which is, a, which is really a resource we, we rarely think about. But they have the ability to be a neutral convening partner in a community and bring together partners that typically don't get together 
and that typically don't um, get together in a way that engages them in a very neutral conversation. So the beauty of, of community foundations is they don't really have any skin in the game other than they, they care about the entire community, right? From kind of a different perspective. Um, so get to know those kind of resources that are, 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 are groups in your community who bring people together in difficult times. That's uh, good advice, and I and I think uh, unfortunately we don't have time to dig deeper into that. But but I'm sure those those that are in this session and and uh, and those that will see it on YouTube and elsewhere will will want to know more about that. I'm hopeful that uh, you'll stay with us as we move forward into new sessions in a few months. Nancy, it's so great to hear your perspective and and you know your experience and bring that to uh, as a case for what we've been discussing. And uh, I just want to also thank Angie once again for for your your expertise and for your delivery of that expertise. Uh, so awesome to have worked with you over these last three sessions. And I look forward to continuing working with you in uh, extension disaster education, as well as it, with the Military Families Learning Network. So thank you very much, uh, both of you. And I'll turn it now over to, to Coral uh, to, to wrap us up. And I uh, just uh, also wanted to, to, to thank this audience. You all have been great over these three sessions. I really appreciate you. And uh, back to you, Coral. Thank you, Keith, uh, for moderating not just this session, but our two prior this fall. And a uh, massive thank you also to Dr. Angie Lindsay and as well as to Nancy Beers for being our final guest speaker for this incredible series. And thank you, everybody who participated today. I am excited to announce that registration is now open and available uh, for the 2021 Military Family Readiness Academy, which will focus on disaster and hazard readiness in action. We'll be discussing and focusing on skills, contexts, and situations for military family service providers that you can draw from and navigate uh, as y'all manage disasters and emergencies within your professional fields. Uh, this is a continuation from our 2020 MFRA that we are concluding today. And participants can choose from a range of sessions that offer guidance on how to work effectively with families during disasters and hazards. Uh, and also many of these sessions will also draw from the recent ongoing situations uh, providers are facing during this COVID-19 pandemic. We'll also be offering this spring a community recovery and resilience workshop as part of our 2021 Academy series. The workshops will focus on and facilitate small group discussions, focusing on what we've learned as providers during the COVID-19 pandemic with the goal of creating resources we can all use as we continue to provide services and support to military families. Please visit the MFRA 2021 homepage for additional session information as well as to register. We're also excited to let everyone know uh, that as we conclude the 2020 series, we'll be inviting you to participate and complete the uh, series evaluation, which will also enter you for a chance to win a copy of Your It Crisis Change and How to Lead When It Matters Most. An email will be sent later today with a link to respond and to enter. So today's session is approved for a number of continuing education credits, including FinCert, AFCPE, Certified Family Life Educators, Registered Dietitians, and Dietetic Technicians. Uh, also for the Commission for Case Managers and for Social Work, Licensed Professional Counselors, and Licensed Marriage and Family Therapists with the UT School, uh, Austin Steve Hicks School of Social Work. So to obtain continuing education credit or a certificate of completion, please go to today's session page and you'll follow the purple continuing education button under the section header. This will take you to the evaluation. Once you've completed the evaluation for today's session, a list will appear for the available continuing education options. From there, simply follow the link or links in which you're interested in obtaining CE credit for. For each continuing education option you submit for, you will receive an email to the address that you provided with a certificate for that credential or certificate. If you have any questions regarding continuing education opportunities or need some troubleshooting advice, please email my colleague Kathleen Halavity at her email address, which is listed here on the slide. You can also deepen your discussion and reflection as well as network with other practitioners by joining us in the outpost online. And finally, to conclude, we do invite you to explore our other resources, both um, upcoming and archived across a host of areas all supporting military family readiness. You can find more 
about these opportunities on our MFLN website. So once more, just an incredibly massive thank you to our facilitator, Dr. Angie Lindsay, Dr. Keith Tedball for moderating, and to Nancy Beers and the many other uh, guest speakers we've had for this fall series. Thank you all so much for joining us, and we look forward to seeing you again in the spring.